Okay, we've got uh, two good uh, speakers here today. Uh, we've got uh, Stuart Snow from SciFair ISD. He's the chief uh, financial officer, and he's going to explain to us about how the state of Texas finances schools, which is undergoing a revision. And then we have uh, Colleen Dipple, who works for the group Families Empowered to help families look at schools and make some rational decisions about it. And uh, got any new people here? Anyway, you're, you're welcome. Make sure you sign the list and uh, you like your email and your phone number and all you'll get is a uh, reminder and uh, things like that. You don't give the list to anybody else. It's just for telling you what's going on here. And uh, as I said before, this is not a pack. We don't support anything. We don't have an agenda. It's just a place to, to voice things. But our basic thing is uh, if you uh, sort of three goals is if you uh, are looking to protect individual rights as outlined in the Constitution. The second thing is, is to go for small, efficient government at all levels, uh, electing leaders that adhere to the to the uh, Constitution, although we don't endorse or disapprove or anything like that, we just give them forum to talk. And then we like strong natural defense. So if you believe in those four things, you're in the right place. And our, our format here is pretty simple. We're just polite, ladies and gentlemen. And, and we let the speaker talk. And we can ask questions. And I sort of moderate that. And we don't debate people on things. So anyway, uh, just to uh, start it off here, we'll let Stuart go uh, first. Just to give you a little background on the Texas education here. In the 1887 Constitution, Texas Constitution, it says the state of Texas will provide for education. Even in the 1845 Constitution. It said the state of Texas will provide for education in the state. And then about 100 years ago, they started uh, forming the municipal school districts, things like that, which formalized what we see throughout the state. And so what they did in the case here at SciFair, they gave Cypress, the community, and Fairbanks a charter. So these schools are charters. They get a charter just like you get from the a great city or a, uh, a corporation here in Texas. And then Cyprus and Fairbanks merged 77 years ago. And then about 40 years ago, we had the first lawsuits brought saying there was an in inequity, an imbalance between funding of various school districts. So seven times since that time, the uh, the Supreme Court has looked at various suits and things like that. And through those 40 years, it's just been a patchwork of, uh, as the last Supreme Court uh, decision said, Texas is fair in the way they allocate the money. But like I said, it's a Byzantine system with a bunch of bureaucrats and all. And uh, it's a Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid to arrange the financing of the school. And uh, so, Thankfully, it looks like our legislature this time is going to address this. You know, got some positive signs. They're going to try to do something to make it sensible. So, Stuart's going to go through and show you how all these Byzantine formulas are used to create the funding for the school. And uh, don't be afraid if you don't understand all of it, because Stuart's probably one of the hundred in the whole state that really understands it. And probably only half the politicians understand it. If, if half. So anyway, we'll let the Stuart start, mm -hmm. and he's just going to address how uh, how the formula is calculated and how Cyber gets their money, not how they spend it, not the trick. It. So anyway, so Stuart, thank you, Joe. Can you all hear me? I couldn't hear Joe at all. I Is Mike working? Well, you can hear me because I'm standing right here. I don't know. Can you hear me from the back? Julie? All right. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, I brought along a couple of folks with me that I work a lot with. In fact, I work, I probably see more of them than I do my own family. But uh, Teresa Hull in the back, uh, she's, staff, uh, she's in the red uh, back there. And then uh, uh, Karen Smith right here is the Assistant Superintendent for Business and Financial Services for Cyber ISD. Uh, again, my name is Stuart Snow, and uh, I am the Chief Financial Officer for Cyber uh, uh, Fairbanks Independent School District. And uh, Joe asked me to talk a little bit about school finance, and um, which is a pretty broad, pretty broad subject, very complex. Uh, and, but he wanted me to, to I'm not going to get into the, the, the weeds on this a whole lot, but I think it's important that Joe wanted me to get into some of these weeds so that you can kind of get an understanding of the complexity of school finance and the uh, school finance system that's in law right now in the state of Texas for school districts. So uh, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about school finance and I've titled that School Finance 101. Uh, and this is just an overview. Again, just an overview of school finance without trying to get uh, too detailed, but to give you a little bit of detail to uh, uh, allow you to understand the complexity of it all. So what we're going to talk about today, um, I'm going to show you a little bit about the uh, 2019 biennium state budget. Uh, show you how uh, the magnitude of that and, and, and we're going to talk about the sources of funding for school districts uh, Have an overview of state revenue and how state revenue is computed and uh, the all of the assumptions and uh, formulas formulas that go into Computing state revenue talk about chapters 41 and 42 a little bit uh, uh, About that and recapture who all has heard about recapture Okay so we'll talk about recapture, how that works, um, and then an overview of property taxes. And then what I don't have on the slide here is kind of my last slide, last couple of slides, is to show you the impact to Cyfair ISD uh, over the last four or five years in terms of the amount of state revenue that we receive compared with the amount of tax revenue uh, that we receive in order to fund the uh, um, uh, our daily operations uh, of the school district and to provide the education uh, for our students. I have a question. Certainly. So it sounds like you're going to talk about the way it works today. Yes, current law. Um, do you have insight or could you share anything about, um, and I have no idea what proposals or schools of thought are percolating among you know, the state legislators and, and what the alternatives are that they're looking at to correct the problems. Um, I'm not talking about that today, but I can tell you that the uh, legislature just started this month uh, and we're uh, more hopeful this year with this session than we have been in many, many sessions uh, because the legislature, the legislators uh, uh, appear to be committed to put more money into the, the system, make it more adequate. Uh, so we're hopeful about that. We don't know exactly... Um, you know how that's going to shake out obviously uh, that's going to be a long process that uh, when they adjourn at the end of may uh, we'll have um, you know obviously we'll know but uh, uh, so there's uh, i know the speaker of the house is committed to uh, support public schools and uh, the senate uh, for uh, for this session has has committed also to uh, to be able to provide additional funding for public schools. How that's going to work out in the negotiation process, we just have no idea. No emerging consensus? Yet. No, no, not at all. And then the governor has a plan as well for uh, tax relief as well as uh, uh, revenue caps. So there's a lot of factors involved that we just don't know at, at this point in time where we're going to end up. So this, uh, this slide is just a, this is the uh, 2019 biennium, and as you know, the, the state legislature budgets the state's budget uh, on a two-year period of time. Uh, so uh, this biennium uh, end, uh, ended uh, or is going to end, and so they're going to be in session to try to uh, develop another state budget for the 2021 biennium. Uh, so the state budget, uh, a number of sources here, uh, totaling $216.6 billion dollars. 
uh, of which 106.6 billion come from the general revenue. We have uh, dedicated general revenues of about $6.3 billion. Uh, and then uh, other revenues. Uh, and then we have federal revenue of about $71.8 billion. Now, the legislature does not have anything to do with the federal revenue. They don't budget for it. Federal revenue to uh, the state and to school districts. School districts have, uh, receive federal revenues as well, but it's just passed through money. The federal government sends it to the state or TEA in the case of uh, school districts, and then the state passes that down to the various uh, departments and organizations within the, within the state. Um, so in, in the next slide, I'm going to show you. I'm going to take that out because that's not part of the state's budget in terms of uh, what they deliberate over. So then in the third, in the second column, the middle column there, you can see that uh, that's Article 3 budget. Article 3 is the Constitution article that relates to education. And that is uh, public education, it's higher education, it's adult education, it's uh, uh, schools for the deaf, it's, it's anything having to do with education is budgeted in Article 3. And you can see that general revenues in Article 3 of 56.5 billion, um, totaling uh, 70 billion for uh, the re general revenues and the other. And then uh, you can see there also that of the federal revenue total state budget, uh, there is uh, $10.7 billion of federal revenue that goes into Article 3. Uh, so Article 3 represents 37.4% of the entire state budget, uh, including the, uh, the federal revenues. And then the TEA budget. TEA budget is part of the Article 3 budget. So I'm pulling out the TEA budget from part Article 3, and uh, it's the TEA budget that funds and operates the public school districts, uh, as well as higher ed, as well. but uh, uh, primarily uh, uh, funding for school districts. So you can see there that general revenues in the TEA budget, $36.6 billion. Have other revenues of $8.2 billion. Federal revenue that's passed through uh, the state uh, from, the, or passed from the uh, federal government to the state down to the local school districts of $10.4 billion. So a total TEA budget of $55 billion, uh, 58 million. So that's about, uh, if you look at the 44 billion, the total, the subtotal of the general revenue and the dedicated general revenue and the other, 100, and, let's see, uh, $44.8 billion, that represents 31% of the entire state budget. Overall, including the federal revenue, uh, represents 25 and a half percent of the entire state budget. Sir? Yes, ma'am. Article 3 just pertains to public schools. Public schools, anything having to do with education throughout the state. Public schools, K through 12, uh, as well as higher education, colleges and universities and some other things. Is it just state, not, I mean, not private, public. I'm sorry. Is it just public, not private stuff? No, uh, not private schools, correct. So this slide just, it's the same information. I just pulled out the federal government, uh, the federal revenues because again, the uh, Texas legislature does not budget for that. Um, and it gives you a better picture of, of what their responsibility is, is in terms of developing the budget to uh, uh, fund both article, fund the state, article three as well. Okay, so what percentage of the budget is state funding to school districts? Now, as we're going to look at in a few, in a few minutes, uh, the state and the individual school districts share the cost of providing a public education to those students in their, in their uh, school district. So the TEA budget uh, for school districts uh, K through 12 is $44.8 billion. Thus, the uh, state also budgets an amount for property tax revenues, and those property tax revenues are derived specifically from 
the tax levies that school districts, uh, uh, the, the tax receipts, the tax revenues that school districts are expecting to receive uh, in order to, uh, uh, to uh, provide for the, uh, the cost of education of their individual school districts. So you can see that the TEA budget for state funding, that's the amount, of the, the amount of funding that they're expecting to send down to the school districts to help operate their, uh, their uh, campuses. So property tax revenues by the state, they're expecting statewide for the biennium to be $65.8 billion. The FSP budget, that's the Foundation School Program. School districts receive their state funding through the Foundation School Program. And so the, uh, of the TEA budget of $44.8 million, $41.6 billion is in the Foundation School Program. And the Foundation School Fund then, uh, uh, that's the amount of money that all of the state is expecting to send to school districts to uh, to help educate the students across the state. So you can see that state funding represents 38.7%. Again, I, I mentioned that school districts and, and uh, uh, the state share in the cost of providing an education for the students in each of those individual school districts. And so 38% um, of that uh, is, is derived from the state revenues and the remainder is 62.3%. Uh, is provided through tax revenues at the local school district. Just an aside, well, I'll talk about it a little later, but uh, uh, initially the intent of the legislature is that the state and the school district share equally in providing the cost of education. In other words, 50% should come from the state, 50% should come from tax revenues that the school districts levy on the values in their district. So as you can see there, that uh, that is not 50%, 38% is coming from the state and the rest from property taxes. The FSP plus budget, uh, that is the FSP Foundation School Program budget plus uh, about $1.3 billion that's provided to the state, by the state to school districts to help fund uh, facilities. Uh, so if a school district builds a school uh, to accommodate student enrollment growth, and they, when they, when they sell bonds to build that school, they incur debt, and the uh, debt then, the principal and interest on that debt is, is paid by the uh, school district through tax uh, revenues. Uh, you, you all don't see that in your tax bill, that, but that's part of your tax levy. Um, the state has a program, two different programs that provide uh, help or relief to some of those fast growth school districts to be able to help pay for the principal and interest on that debt. Uh, not all school districts uh, qualify for that. Cypher ISD does not qualify for that. Uh, but that's what the difference is. That's, that plus budget is for facilities. So this is a chart showing the share percentages uh, that are provided to educate students. Uh, in 2012, you can see that uh, see, the local property taxes represented 54% of the total revenues to be able to uh, support the education of their students, and 46% of, of the uh, operating revenues for school districts came from state revenues. Actually, I don't have it on the slide here, but in 2011, the year prior to that, it was about 50% uh, uh, an equal share. So what you, can, what you see here is since 2012, the amount that is, uh, uh, the amount uh, from property taxes that is uh, helping to fund each school district's uh, education continues to go up in terms of a proportionate share. So in 2019, as, you, as, I, as I showed you in a minute, uh, or a minute ago, that. 62% of the cost of education that uh, school districts are providing uh, comes from local property taxes. Um, and 38% is coming from uh, state revenue. So that's $11.8 billion gap. And so if, if the uh, state were to put more money into uh, the school districts to help 
the uh, operations that school district, if they went back to the 40 40 percent in 2018, uh, that would cost the state 3.9 billion dollars to do that. And if they went up to uh, 50 percent, like the uh, uh, legislature's intent is all along, then that would cost 5.7 billion dollars. So it's very expensive. Uh, for the state to be able to uh, bring that percentage back up to an equal share. Okay, this is just a pie chart showing the sources of revenues from the state side. You can see there the big pies, 62% coming from local property taxes, 38% uh, coming from state sources, uh, state revenue, and this is the, this is the sources for school funding. You always hear, well, um, I thought the lottery was helping to fund public schools. Well, it is uh, at about 6%. So of that 38% that school districts receive from the state, 6% of that is coming from the lottery, about $2.5 billion. Uh, 7% billion, or 7 is coming from the state, uh, the available school fund at $3 billion. The property tax relief fund, about three and a half billion dollars, eight percent of that thirty-eight percent. Eleven percent of that thirty-eight percent is coming from recapture, uh, and that's about four and a half billion dollars uh, a biennium. And so you talk about recapture, and we'll show you recapture in a minute, but that's when the state or when school districts have to pay back to the state to lower their equalized wealth uh, under the Robin Hood plan. So uh, school districts send back money to the state that the state then redistributes that money to uh, property for school districts under that Robin Hood plan. And so the state is relying on that recapture of four and a half billion dollars. And then the foundation school fund uh, of general revenues uh, is 68% of that 38% or $29 billion. And so if you add all of that, all of those numbers up, uh, that's about that's that $43 billion of the state budget that's going to school districts. So we'll talk a little bit about state revenue, kind of dive into that a little bit, uh, show you how that's computed and what it's used for. Uh, again, 38% of the school district's operating revenues coming from the state. Should be 50, it's 38% it's right now. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, the uh, district and the state uh, share in, the co in providing the cost of education for their students. And the state revenue is formula driven. The amount of state revenue that we receive uh, at Cypher ISD and all other school districts in the state of Texas receive is based on formulas as set out in statute, in law. And uh, over time, uh, Joe mentioned, I did hear part of that Byzantine uh, patchwork quilt type of a system where um, the the system of uh, public uh, public school district revenues and finance uh, has not been overhauled in a long long time but it's just been patchwork um, but all of those uh, formulas are in in the law in the Texas Education Code uh, chapters 41 and 42 so the state revenue then is computed based upon the number of students that a school district has uh, on a daily basis. Uh, there it's called uh, uh, average daily attendance. It's also dependent upon a weighting of those students and I'll show you that in a few minutes. So that's a weighted average daily attendance. Have you ever heard of WADA? Well that's what it is, weighted average daily attendance. And I'll show you how that's computed actually and what goes into that. The amount of state revenue that a school district receives also depends upon their property tax values as determined by the state comptroller. Uh, it's also determined by the tax rate of the school district and the uh, tax revenues that a school district would receive based upon those revenues, I mean based upon those taxable property values and the, um, uh, the tax rate of the school district. And then it also depends upon the number of students in special populations, such as uh, special ed, bilingual, compensatory ed, and, and, and such. So we have a formula for every one of those things that determines what your, uh, what your state revenue will, will be 
uh, on an annual basis. What's yes, compensatory ed? Compensatory ed, we received, and I'll, I'll show you that in a few minutes. Compensatory education is a, uh, a uh, grant type uh, program, part of state revenue uh, that is measured by the number of students in free and reduced breakfast and lunch program. It's for those, those kids that are economically disadvantaged. So under the Robin Hood type of a system and concept as that last bullet there is, as, as the property values in the school district rises, the amount of state revenue that we receive uh, to operate the school district uh, is, is uh, we get less money from the state to do that. So it declines. So you think that when you're, you get your tax bill, uh, we haven't changed our tax rate in a number of years, but uh, the property values continue to rise, and so you continue to have an increase in your taxes, right? That money doesn't go to the, the school district. We don't get, we don't receive any of that increase of your taxes to help operate the school district because we, the state reduces our state revenue dollar for dollar for every amount of, of tax revenue that we receive. Yes, ma'am. But the values will rise, but that doesn't necessarily tie to how much revenue it generates. The, that's correct because, because of that concept that as those values rise, our tax revenues increase but our state revenue decreases dollar for dollar. So we're, so you, we don't get that. That money goes back to the state to help fund other parts of the state budget. So does this mean that if there's a district that property values are decreasing, that the state doesn't get more state money? That's right. That's, did you hear the question? If the property values are, are declining, then we would receive uh, more state revenue under the formulas. So any increases in the property values above what the state has budgeted for? Yes, you saw where the budget, the budget for uh, property property value uh, or the, the tax revenues was sixty-five billion dollars. So, showed that to you a little bit ago. If the, that's what the state is budgeting for to, to help offset the cost of education for school districts, if any of those property, if any of those tax revenues in, um, uh, are uh, above that, higher than that. All of that goes back to the state to fund other programs in the state budget. So I threw this slide in here because I still get uh, questions about target revenue. Has anybody heard about target revenue? Okay, well good. <laughs> because it doesn't exist any longer. But. Uh, <laughs> But I still get questions about it uh, because it's a hold harmless. Back in, two, in uh, 2005, do you remember back in 2005 the legislature uh, reduced all of the school district property taxes? Remember that? So the uh, most school district property taxes were capped at $1.50 per $100 of uh, taxable value. The state came in and said, we're going to reduce your value, we're, we're going to reduce your property taxes over a two year period down to a dollar. So this was in the 79th legislature. So when the property tax rates go down, school districts obviously, what? They don't receive as much uh, state, as much revenue. So the, the state said, we're gonna hold those school districts harmless. If, if, uh, if you're gonna be reducing your uh, uh, tax rate and you're not going to be receiving the uh, tax revenues uh, that uh, correspond to that tax rate then we're going to hold you harmless we're going to provide you with additional state revenue to bring you back up and that's what's called the hold harmless and they did that by calculating a target revenue and the target revenue is saying okay we're going to match this amount of money uh, that's our target that's our revenue target and if you fall below that in the cap calculations we're going to we're going to fund the difference. And so that target revenue was computed by using three different formulas. And this is kind of where it gets, like I said, starts to get a little complex. But under House Bill 1, this was House Bill 1, uh, those three uh, methods to, con to uh, uh, calculate target revenue was, it would be the greater of three different calculations, either the revenue 
uh, on a per student basis that was available in the 2005-2006 uh, uh, school year or the revenue per, on a per student basis that would have been available uh, in 2006-2007 using uh, under the, the new 2006-2007 funding formulas that were outlined in House Bill 1, but using the old tax rate, the, year, the tax rate the year before in 506. Or uh, revenue on a per student basis in 2006-07 uh, under the House Bill 1 formulas and using the 2006-07 uh, compressed tax rate. The compressed tax rate, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use that term a little bit more, but that's the compression, the compression from the $1.50 original tax rate down to a dollar that was compressed so that tax rate was compressed and so the compressed rate would be a dollar in most cases so uh, house bill 21 this past legislative session well actually uh, it was it was stated in law several years ago that this method would would uh, uh, be repealed uh, or would run out in September on September 1 in 2017 and so uh, with this last legislative session uh, it, uh, they allowed it to be repealed and so it no longer exists however House Bill 21 this last session uh, provided for I don't even have it here, I've got it later provided for some hardship grants because school districts would still be after the repeal of, of target revenue uh, they would still be receiving uh, kind of a hit, a negative hit on their state revenue. They would be losing state revenue, and so uh, House Bill 21 established some some hardship grants for those school districts to be able to apply for to help them out. All right, so now we're getting into the kind of the little nitty gritty of how state revenue is computed. State revenue for school districts under the Foundation School Program has three tiers. Tier one is the cost of a basic education for, for school districts. And I'll, I'll show you what tier two and tier three is later on. But tier one is a, um, a sum, a summation of all of these different formulas. Tier one includes the amount of uh, money that we would receive from the state for regular students. Uh, uh, it's a regular, it's called a regular program allotment. And each of those students, each of those students that are in a regular program, not in a special program or receiving spe uh, special services, that, that student is considered one student. And uh, we receive an amount of money for that one student applied to an adjusted basic allotment uh, at the uh, average daily attendance for that student, for those students in total. The basic allotment, and I'll show you this in a little bit, the basic allotment is set out in statute that each school district would receive for their regular students $5,140 per student. But in these calculations, we adjust for that for regional cost differences, and I'll show you that as well. Also in tier one are allotments for uh, our students that are in special programs. Uh, that's a uh, special program allotment uh, that's based on full-time equivalency of those students being in the classroom. And you can see it's the uh, uh, mix of students that are in special programs such as career and technology, compensatory education, uh, gifted and talented, special education, bilingual education. So the concept here in the, and the legislature understands that a student that is receiving uh, special services in any one of these programs, it costs more to educate that student. So they apply a weighting system for those students. So instead of that student being uh, equivalent to the one regular student, that student is equivalent to a weighted student of, for instance, um, in gifted and talented. If a student is in gifted and talented, that one student is, is considered 1.12 students. Okay, gotcha. So in special education, we have a range of waiting there you can see from 1.7 to 5 so if a student is a student is receiving uh, speech therapy services at the school district that one student is considered five students uh, for funding purposes 
Now the FTE comes into play because not all of those students are in the classroom for how many periods do we have? Eight? Seven? Seven. Seven. So not, not all of those students are in uh, receiving special services for all seven classroom uh, periods during the day. They may be in a they may be receiving special uh, education services, uh, speech therapy services for maybe one or two periods during the day. And so each of those students then we have to go in and calculate what a full-time equivalency for uh, what those students are on a full-time basis. And then each of those students then, uh, the total of those students in those special programs then are determined based upon the, uh, the FTE times the um, adjusted basic, basic allotment times the weighting of that students. And so that's the way uh, our special program allotments are given and the amount of money that we receive under the foundation school program for those students. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I notice all these weightings are factors. Okay. I, and they're sorry, also I, factors, which is like one point something. Uh, except for gifted and talented and bilingual education, that's zero point. Something. How does that, is that a factor or additional add-on? Yeah, it's just an additional add-on, a factor just like anything else. So a student in bilingual education uh, is considered, that one student is considered, instead of 1.0, it's 1.1. So it should have been, as a factor, it should have been 1.12 point, point for gifted and talented. And for compensation, it should have been 1.2. Well, that's the additional one I'm showing here is the add-on to the one to the one regular student. And so it's it's not a weighting then it's not a factor it's an additive. That's so correct. You're saying that a, a gifted and talented career technology guy would count as two point three five guys. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Is that what the number? That's saying? that's correct. Yes. Okay. And then the gifted talent guy is. 1.12 guys. That's correct. Okay, so that's that's not a weighting. It's a additive. It's an add-on to the. ADR. Right under the concept that those students in those special programs, it costs more to educate. Uh, you know, a, a student in uh, than it would be in a regular regular program. Also in tier one, there's a. Uh, uh, high school allotment. So for every student that we have in grades 9 through 12, currently in, under current law, uh, we receive $275 for, for each of those students uh, that are there on a daily basis. And then a new instructional facilities allotment, uh, a, a certain amount of money on an ADA basis. That new instructional facilities allotment is to help school districts that open a brand new school there are certain uh, startup costs for that school that, to, to get that school operating. And so the state will provide over a two year period some help and relief for that school district to provide the operating startup costs. In the first year, it would be all of the students that uh, entered into that school. And then in the second year, it would be the incremental increase in the number of students that uh, that school. And then we receive also a transportation allotment, and that's provided for uh, transporting students at a, a two mile or greater uh, limit. There are other uh, other funding adjustments. Uh, SciFair uh, obviously do not qualify for any of these. Uh, small, there's a small school adjustment, and this is to try to help uh, account for um, some economies of, say, of scale. Larger school districts uh, have economies of scale that uh, mid-size and, and uh, small school districts do not. And so there are certain adjustments that uh, those school districts receive. Uh, if a school district has rapidly declining property values, that's, that's uh, causing a significant burden on the amount of revenues that that school district would be able to receive. Um, say a, uh, a major manufacturing firm leaves, leaves the school district and uh, that property value goes away. Um, and then uh, the hardship grants I mentioned under House Bill 1 that was passed to be able to help those school districts that uh, lost funding because of the uh, repeal of target revenue, uh, whole harmless system. 
Okay, talk about the cost of education index. Anybody hear about the cost of education index? It's a big topic at the legislative level. Uh, cost of education index is, um, it was established in 1991 by the Legislative Budget Board uh, and has never been adjusted since then. And so what it is, it's a, uh, it accounts for uh, differences in regional cost differences, primarily for teachers. And so a teacher in the Houston area, great competition for teachers, especially in, in our area and in, the, in Cyprus and uh, Katy, Spring Branch, Spring, Klein, Tomball, great competition for teachers. And it costs more to educate, more to, uh, in terms of teacher salaries for us than maybe it would be in the Valley or in West Texas. And so this cost of education index uh, is to account for regional cost differences. And it actually uh, impacts the amount of state funding, increases the amount of state funding in certain cases. So it's assigned to each school district to adjust for the very economic conditions. As I mentioned, it uh, adjusts the basic allotment, and I'll show you how that works. It depends on, it's primarily, as I mentioned, on teacher salaries, but it also depends on the number of economically disadvantaged students the school district has, uh, and um, the, uh, the size of the district as well. So one half of the CEI, Cost of Education Index, uh, factors into the calculation of the weighted average daily attendance. The value of the CEI ranges statewide from 1.02 to 1.20. The average across the state is about 1.12. Cost of education index that's assigned to SciFair ISD in many of the, uh, our uh, neighboring school districts is 1.16. So again, uh, hasn't been adjusted or updated in about 20 years. And as you can imagine, with inflation and everything else, costs certainly costs have increased since then uh, dramatically. So this is kind of to show you the impact that that cost of education index has on the school districts and has on their has on their funding. I've got two school districts up here: Northside ISD in San Antonio and Sidecar ISD. North is probably our uh, most similar school district in the state. Uh, Sidefair is the third largest school district in the state. Northside uh, is the fourth largest. So we have about 100 and almost 118,000 students. Uh, Northside have about 110,000, maybe 115,000 students. So I chose Northside because they are so similar to us, not only in size but also in our in demographics. Um, and you can see this is the calcul this is actually the calculation of uh, the adjusted basic allotment. And, and remember, the adjusted basic allotment is the amount. Go back here. The adjusted basic allotment goes into the calculation of the amount of state revenues that a school district receives, because that adjusted basic allotment is applied to the number of students in those programs. So it's very important. So the adjusted basic allotment is uh, the basic allotment. Remember, the basic allotment is set out in statute, $5,140 per student. And it's using 71% of a district's cost of education index. So why 71%? Anybody have any idea? I don't think anybody knows any idea. I mean, I, I think, I think, <laughs> I think, that back in 1991, when the cost of education index was developed, that's all the state could afford. They couldn't afford, why not 100%? Well, it cost too much to put in there. So I think they agreed through negotiation that we're just gonna, we're gonna allow 71% of that cost of education index to be uh, applicable. So anyway, so they take 71% uh, of that times the uh, basic allotment, and so, that cost of education index then increases Northside's basic allotment by uh, $401 and, what, $401 from $5,140 to $5,541. Uh, $5, so it's significant.
because that's a lot of money for Northside ISD and it, and it increases their state revenue. So at 110,000 students at Northside, that represent that hundred that hundred and four or that four hundred and one dollar increase represents over forty four million dollars of state revenue that they would receive that they would otherwise not receive without that CEI. So compare that with Sycar ISD. As I mentioned, our uh, CEI is uh, one point one six, and go through the calculation. Uh, our basic allotment increases from fifty one forty. Thousand seven hundred and twenty-four, an increase of what five hundred and eighty-four dollars per student. So uh, the difference between our cost of education index, or uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the difference, the difference between our cost of education index and the and the effect that it has on the basic allotment is one hundred and eighty-three dollars per student, or twenty-one million dollars. Uh, that we would receive more than Northside ISD just because our basic, uh, because our CEI is uh, a little bit higher than theirs. So the $5,724 uh, basic allotment uh, translates to about $64 million of state revenue for Sider ISD. Very important. One of the, as an aside, to help answer one of your questions, one of the things that we heard from the state legislature is that they may be doing away with the CEI because it is too complex and they can't figure out how to fix it. And I'm the, uh, the sign to speed it up. I'm going to take it all the time I need, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and so I cut you off. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I mentioned that uh, state revenue has three tiers. We just talked about tier one. Tier two is a guaranteed yield enrichment program. Its uh, uh, purpose is to supplement tier one uh, to provide additional programs for school districts and it depends upon the district's tax rate above $1.06. Uh, and then tier three is for facilities. Uh, again, that's the uh, uh, what I mentioned before uh, to help school districts pay principal and interest on, on the debt that they incur when they uh, uh, construct school buildings. Two different programs, the existing debt allotment and the instructional facilities allotment. So this is how the weighted average daily attendance is figured. This is WADA. So you take your tier, you add up all of your tier one allotments. Add those all up. Subtract out your transportation allotment. Subtract out the new instructional facilities allotment. Subtract out the high school allotment. And then use 50% of the CEI adjustment. 50%, you know, again, I don't know where they came up with that, but I think it was just a budget thing. Uh, and then they divide all of that by the basic allotment of 5140 to give the average daily attendance. So this I put in here so that you could get an understanding of how all of that works. And when I said that as your uh, property values increase, the amount of state revenue that a district receives increases, the amount of state, I mean, sorry, the amount of tax revenue that the school district receives increases, but the amount of state revenue is reduced. So tier one, you have your prog regular program allotment, all of your special program allotments, and then Total tier one, total of tier one, that is the basic level of education. Then you subtract from that the local fund assignment. The local fund assignment is the amount of tax revenue that a district would, would expect to receive based on their tax rate and based on the taxable property values as determined by the state controller. So as you can see then that as the uh, uh, tax revenue increases, the net state share of tier one decreases. And then you have tier two programs, so under the total foundation school program. Everybody with me on that? Talk about chapters 41 and 42 of the Texas Education Code. And this gets into the Robin Hood concept. Uh, property wealth per school district determines whether a district is wealthy or whether it's a poor school district as, as considered by the Texas Education Code. 
and by uh, the state legislature. So the property wealth of the school district is the total comptroller's values divided by the number of students, the WANA, the weighted average daily uh, attendance, and um, Chapter 41 of the Texas Education Code governs those school districts that are considered property wealthy. And Chapter 42 can, is, uh, governs those districts that are considered property poor. So the concept here is a district with low property wealth per student should receive the same amount of revenue that a high property wealth uh, district uh, with similar tax rates. So a, 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 say Highland Park ISD in, in, uh, up in the Dallas area, very high property wealth, uh, very affluent, uh, has a very low tax rate. They're able, to, they're able to generate more revenue based on their property values and low tax rate than a school district, say, down in the valley that has very low property wealth. So this is the Robin Hood concept that uh, those poor school districts should be receiving equal amounts of revenue on a, uh, or at least similar, uh, at similar tax rate levels. So property wealth, uh, chapter 41, uh, a district is considered property wealthy uh, under chapter 41 if their property wealth per student is greater than or is uh, $319,500 or greater. And that's called equalized wealth level. And so if a district has a property wealth, equalized wealth level equal to that or greater, they're property wealthy. If you're below that, you're property poor. And if a district is property wealthy, then they're required in the law to reduce their equalized wealth level using one of these five methods. They can either uh, consolidate with another school district, they can detach property uh, and send it off to another school district. In Houston ISD, if you recall a few years ago, they were uh, uh, in that dilemma. Uh, option three is to purchase uh, attendance credits from the state, and that's kind of like writing a check back to the state uh, option four is they could educate students from another district or they could consolidate uh, tax bases with another school district. I'm sorry, I can't, I've got music in my ear. No, we actually, uh, Cypher ISD, we're in our third year of being a property wealthy school district under Chapter 41. We have a wealth per student of about $368,000. What we have to do is to tell the, tell the TEA which option we would have to use uh, uh, if we were subject to recapture. We're not subject to recapture yet, but we have to choose an option anyway to let them know just in case. And we've chosen option three but it doesn't affect our budget at this point in time at all. It's just a, a formality. So chapter 41, equalized wealth, we're getting into recapture now. If a school district has an equalized wealth of greater than $514,000 per average daily attendance, then uh, their tax collections uh, applied to that um, uh, to the compressed rate up to that $514,000 is recaptured back to the state. Back to the state. Uh, level two is a school district is allowed to retain the tax revenues. Is this cutting out? Yes. Yeah. Is allowed to retain tax revenues on equivalent tax efforts raised by Austin ISD on the first six pennies. And then uh, level three, if a school district is subject to recapture, then they would recapture anything uh, above three hundred nineteen thousand five hundred if their tax rate uh, is between seven seven cents and a dollar eleven the maximum tax rate a school district can have is a dollar seventeen um, but the maximum amount that a school district can have without voter approval in an election is a dollar four uh Cypher isd's tax rate currently is a dollar four actually this year a dollar six going back to a dollar four uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so uh,
Um, our equalized, and as I mentioned, our equalized wealth level is about uh, three hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars per weighted student. And we are, even though we're a Chapter Forty-One or a property wealthy school district, we're not subject to recapture unless or until we increase our tax rate from a dollar four to a dollar six. We did that under special circumstances, and I'll talk about that for one year only. Um, and again, the recapture, as I showed that pie chart, that four and a half billion dollars per biennium of recapture that school districts uh, send in. Austin ISD is a heavy recapture district. Houston is. Uh, that goes back to the state to help fund uh, the school districts. So this is a comparison. I just wanted to show you a comparison of three different school districts that are one. One of them is a Chapter 42 property poor. Two of them are property wealthy but one of them is not uh, subject to recapture or the other is. So District A has a weighted average daily attendance of 141. That's actually Cypher. Our property values, $51 billion. Our property wealth, and this is 2017-18 uh, data, $362,000 uh, per student. Our m and tax rate is $1.04. So you can see that uh, uh, Go down to the bottom, actually the bottom figure is really the most important there, is we receive revenue per weighted student, uh, 5,841. That compares with District B, which is Austin ISD, and this shows the recapture and the impact that it has on, on uh, Austin. They have a, a weighted student, uh, 100,000. Uh, look at their property values, almost a, a trillion dollars, 99 billion 438. Their property wealth is 990, so well above the 714,000 equalized wealth level that kicks them into uh, recapture. Uh, they don't receive any tier one funding because they're property wealthy. So you can see they uh, they have M and O tax collections of 1.136 billion dollars, and see the recapture amount 544 million dollars. So they're sending that back to the state, but even net of even net of that recapture, they're receiving $6,169 per weighted student, much greater than Cypher or ISD. And then District C is a little district up um, in North Texas, it's Meridian, 778 students, and this was just to show that they, uh, this district was a target revenue, hold harmless uh, uh, district under uh, uh, House Bill 1 in, in uh, 2005. So that small district receives revenue per weighted student of $6,014, still higher than Cyber ISD. This is a comparison of our neighboring school districts and where we fall, and it's ranked by revenue per weighted student. KDISD uh, have a the same CEI index that we do, 1.16. They have 90,000 weighted students. Their tax rate is a little bit higher. Uh, equalized wealth level of 358, uh, 977, a Chapter 41 district. But they're receiving $6,632 of uh, revenue per weighted student. Yes, sir. That's total. That's total revenue. Uh, tax and, and state funding. Tom Ball uh, is next, Spring Branch, Houston, Spring, Klein, Alding, we're down at the bottom. So a tax rate of the dollar four, we have a CEI of 1.16, 1 .16. our weighted uh, students 138, and this is 2016-17 data by the way. Our equalized wealth level of 342, 262, uh, but yet, our revenue per weighted student is $5,835. Now, we provide a 20% optional homestead exemption, and so we leave on the table about $52 billion of tax value that we don't tax because of that optional homestead exemption. And that relates to about, uh, uh, gosh, what I put down here, $54 million of tax revenue that we would receive if we didn't have that optional homestead exemption. If we eliminated that, which we can't right now under law, but if we did eliminate that, that would translate to about 392 
weighted students, would, which, which would put us up to just below Spring Branch and above Houston in terms of our weighted, our student, our revenue per weighted student. Talk a little bit about property taxes. Uh, represents well over 62% of our operating revenues. It, rep it supplements our state revenue based on the property values as appraised by the Harris County Appraisal District. Under state revenue, the calculation of state revenue, the property values are determined by the state comptroller. But for tax purposes, tax revenue purposes, those uh, property values are appraised by the Harris County Appraisal District uh, at a rate set by the Board of Trustees. The School District Board of Trustees does not value your property. Uh, they value, they do not uh, appraise your property. Let me put it that way. <laughs> they do value your property. Let me tell you. They, do, they do not appraise your property. All they do is set the tax rate that applies uh, to that property value. Uh, there are two components. When you get your tax bill, all you see is one number. That's a dollar forty-four total tax rate. But the the board of trustees actually, by law, because we have uh, we have debt service, we have debt principal and interest that we have to pay. We have to adopt two separate tax rates: one for maintenance and operations, which is the daily operations of the school district, and one for debt service or INS or interest and sinking fund. And that's to solely to pay solely for the principal and interest on our debt can't be used for any other purpose. So the m and tax rate, as I mentioned, for our daily operations, it's a, uh, the component that is, provides for the, uh, the general operating budget. Uh, it includes all expenditures associated with operating the school district on a daily basis, paying our salaries, our supplies, materials, our utilities, our fuel costs, uh, all of those things. Uh, and that is at a dollar four. Now, in 2018, currently our current our current tax rate is a dollar six, and the reason for that is there's a provision in the tax code, uh, 26.08, that allows school districts, uh, when uh, under a uh, uh, natural disaster such as Hurricane Harvey, uh, when they have to respond to additional expenditures to recover from a natural disaster. Uh, it allows school districts to increase their maintenance and operations tax rate in order to provide the funding to do that uh, without, without the necessity of having a, an election to do so. Remember I said that anything above $1.04 we'd have to have an election? Well, we bumped it up to $1.06 uh, without having the election because of the tax code provision in 2608. But the, on the other side, we didn't just increase the m and tax rate and leave the debt service rate alone we reduced our debt service rate so that your total tax rate uh, was, uh, was the same as it was in the previous year. So our, our debt service tax rate prior to this year was uh, 40 cents. So we did that tax rate swap of two cents, put, uh, took two cents from debt service, uh, put it up into m and uh, so our debt service tax rate is 38 cents. Actually, I'm a slide ahead of you here. But uh, again, we can increase our M&O rate by a total of 13 cents above the dollar four. But again, we have to have a, an election to do so. And this is the debt service tax rate. It's the component levy solely for the principal and interest on our debt. We can't pay salaries. We can't buy supplies, materials, or anything like that. We're restricted by law to just pay the principal and interest on our debt. In 1819, as I mentioned, the tax rate is 38 cents. I'm going to go to the existing debt allotment is one of those provisions in Tier 3 that helps provide school districts with help in, in uh, meeting some of their debt service obligations. Uh, it's, it's also equalized in terms of, when I say equalized, it's like when, when our uh, calculation of total tier one is reduced by our uh, property tax collections, uh, equalizing it and reducing our state revenue. It's the same concept here that uh, it depends upon uh, what our values are, what our tax rate is, and, uh, but we currently do not qualify for any EDA. Now these last three slides, I've got three more slides, and these are probably, in my opinion, the most important slides of this whole presentation. 
because what this shows is the relationship between state revenue and tax revenue in Cypher ISD over a four year period of time. These are audited figures uh, starting in 2014-15. Uh, you can see back on the right hand side uh, and we're going forward to the to the left, audited 15-16, audited 16-17, audited 17-18, and budgeted 18-19. Obviously we're not at the end of our fiscal year yet for 1890s, 18-19, so we haven't haven't uh, we don't have audited figures there. But these are audited figures. Um, and uh, in in 2014-15 our state revenue equaled $393.7 million. Our tax revenues were $415.8 million for a total of $890 or $809.6 million. And you can see that if you look at the uh, state revenue at the top, the top line there, every year since then, our state revenue has declined uh, to 355 in 1516, 333 in 1617, 321 in 1718, and just 278 budgeted for 1819. So over that four year period of time, our state revenue has declined $115 million or 29.2%. Now if you look at tax revenue, that has increased because of our property values that are increasing. So our tax revenues uh, increased from um, 1415 to 449.6 in 1516 and so on down to 2018-19 of 525. So the total amount of revenue, operating revenue that we receive uh, as a school district to operate our, uh, uh, our schools where uh, we have $5.3 million less today than we did in 2014-15. I put that up on a personal level. Say a family uh, has one child in 2014 and uh, over a four year period of time they have two more children they have to buy a new house. Their uh, inflation has increased their expenses, but yet uh, maybe they're maybe they were laid off, or maybe they they haven't received any uh, salary increases over time, and so they're having to deal with additional costs. To to ed we have to deal with additional costs to educate our students, and you can see our enrollment has increased 4.22 percent over that four-year period of time. Our enrollment has increased. 4,772 students um, over that four year period of time. And so like a family that's increasing in size, having to buy another car, a bigger car, a bigger house, increases in inflation, uh, having to provide for the cost of that without a raise uh, is, is, a, is difficult to deal with. This next slide is the same information only on a, on a, on a student, per student basis. So in 2014-15, our audited figures were that uh, we received $3,485 per student for state revenue. We received $3,681 per student of tax revenue for a total of $7,166. And that amount of money, that total amount of money, uh, total amount of revenue has declined each year on a per student basis since then to $6,830 per student today. So on a per student basis over that four year period of time we've lost or we, we uh, our revenue currently is $366 per student less than it was in 14-15 or 4.68 percent again even though our enrollment has increased. And then this slide is just a recap of that, uh, a, a proportionate share showing the amount of state revenue on a percentage basis uh, that we receive as compared with tax revenue. In 14-15, 48.6% of our total revenues came from the state, 51.4% came from tax revenues. And our state revenue share has continued to decline every year to 34.4% 34 
34.6% of our total revenue uh, comes from the state in 1819, whereas uh, we have to make that up with tax revenues at 65.4%. So I guess my message here is that you hear a lot about the adequacy of funding in public schools and whether the legislature is providing adequate funding for, for schools. And I can tell you that these are audited figures and uh, I could, the message is that the legislature is not providing adequate funding and uh, certainly not on a, they're not in, uh, providing funding for enrollment growth because you can see our enrollment continues to grow. So with that, Joe, I'm done. Let's take a couple questions and then we'll let Colleen, our next speaker, have time and then we can come back after Colleen speaks. Stuart's going to be around here as you can see he goes. Question. Yes, sir. Question, how do uh, Texas and Cypress funding for students compare with national averages? And how do they compare with states that provide the best education? You know, that's a hard question to answer. Um, as you can see, with uh, a comparison of our neighboring school districts, the, our comparison of state funding to our neighboring school districts tracks pretty much along with uh, state funding for schools uh, across the state. Uh, but I can tell you that the state of Texas is 48th, 48th, ranks 48th in the nation in terms of the amount of funding that the, that the legislature provides for uh, uh, K through 12 public schools. Yes, good question. Uh, good question. TEA is the Texas Education Agency. Uh, TEA is a uh, is an agency of the state, and it is charged with uh, providing uh, resources and funding to sc uh, public school districts. It's the, this. Uh, I'm not sure where the state board of education falls into that. Teresa, can you help me with that? Yeah, it's a separate board, but I don't know how they work. They're separate in part from TEA. But TEA is a state organization, state agency that um, uh, governs uh, K through 12 school districts across the state. Yes, sir. It appears to me that you're dispensing with one common rumor that I've heard, which is that charter schools help the school districts by taking students out of the district and, and they continue to get funding. And you're telling me it's based strictly on WADA, which means if the charter school student is attending school, Cypher doesn't get any money. That's, that's, that's very true. It's a great point. As a charter school opens up in a school district, they pull students from a uh, uh, public school. The public school, as I showed you, is funded based on the number of students that they have in school on a daily basis. And so if that charter school is, is pulling students from a public school, uh, traditional public school, then that traditional public school is going to be receiving less amount of state revenue. Another point, though, is that uh, you saw where traditional public schools are funded based upon the number of students on a, uh, in school on a daily basis. Charter schools, however, are funded by the average statewide average of revenue per weighted student. So you could see that CyFair ISD on an, uh, received in 17, 16, 17, or whatever year that was, about $5,800 per student. Charter schools uh, receive about $1,000 more per student statewide than traditional K-12 public schools. Because, because it's based on the total statewide average of revenue per student. Okay, Stuart will be around after we finish up. I'm sure you'll have questions. He's got some of his staff here too. Yeah, I'm sure you have questions. All right, next we'd like to, uh, that's a good segue there, Bill. We're, uh, we have Colleen here to organize the group. Andrew, welcome to be here. <laughs> Oh, come. 
Colleen, uh, is with the organization that she helped uh, found Colleen Dipple as Families in Power. And she helps families select a school and maybe get some additional funding and things like that. So, uh, Randy, did you hear about it? Is this on? Yes. Great. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you um, for inviting me. This is actually my second um, time presenting this group. So I am um, the founder and executive director of an organization called Families Empowered. We're a not-for-profit service organization uh, based in Houston, but we serve over 60,000 families in the state of Texas, in Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. Um, and I just want to apologize, I have a pretty bad cold, and I was, I don't have a, a slideshow, uh, I was actually out of work the last two days with a pretty bad cold. I am not contagious, but um, just my voice is a little, just, sorry, bear with me. Um, so I was asked really to speak to you about what we do at Families Empowered and provide sort of a state of, of uh, schools. Um, so we serve over 60,000 families for free, and families come to us uh, when they are not happy with their zone school, and they are looking for alternatives. And we are essentially a school broker, and we are model agnostic, so we work with traditional schools of choice, uh, neighborhood schools, magnet schools, ID schools. We work with charter schools. Uh, we work with private schools. We work with virtual schools. And we work with homeschool networks. So when parents come to us, we do not judge them. We view them as private citizens who know their children and love their children better than the state, better than the elected school board, and quite frankly, even better than the teachers. We think parents actually know their kids and love their kids and know what's best for their kids. But when they come to us, they're generally looking for something other than their zone school. I can give you some you know, insight into why they're leaving their schools, um, but you can probably figure those things out. It's generally things like, uh, my kid isn't learning. We have a lot of families with kids with special needs. Um, kids who are not sort of typical learners, kids on the autism spectrum, kids uh, who are dyslexic, um, and they're not, their needs are not being met. Um, we have kids who are bullied, um, and we actually have parents who learn in third grade that their kids can't read, uh, and they're not okay with that, and rightfully so. Right, so generally they're across the board. The number one reason parents are looking for a school other than their zone school is academics. Um, give you some insight into the parents that we serve generally. Uh, most of our parents are low-income parents, uh, although we have parents in Alamo Heights, which is one of the wealthiest districts in Texas and it's north of San Antonio. Uh, and those parents are generally looking for super aggressive uh, college prep schools and not happy with their neighborhood schools. Um, in Houston, 40% of the parents we serve are actually Spanish dominant speakers, um, and um, the majority of those parents make about $25,000 annually or less. So I'm here to tell you that there's some really good news, which is you know over 60,000 families last year who were poor um, really understand how important education is, and they are willing to go to very extreme lengths to, to um, find a really high quality school. Um, some other sort of changes for us, when we first started, we were serving only families who were kind of on charter school wait lists, uh, and now we have parents coming to us through word of mouth, through other parents, um, and we're seeing some really interesting trends. There are a growing number of parents, actually African-American parents who are homeschooling um, in Dallas and an organization that's dedicated to helping uh, families of color really connect with private school scholarships. So we tend to just say, we're not gonna judge uh, what parents want, we're just gonna help them understand all of the choices available to them. And we've been serving families for nine years in Texas, and we do a lot of survey work, um, and we are providing multiple ways to connect parents to schools. So um, that's just like to give you some insight into kind of our view. We are not an advocacy organization. We don't do lobbying. We're not sort of think tank, wonky analysts. We are, um, 
actually an organization pretty much, um, we have a full-time staff of about 12. Um, we're all moms, which is really interesting. So we have a vested interest. Many of us are former teachers. I'm a former public school teacher. I worked in HISD. Um, I have a master's in ed leadership. Um, and so many of us really understand the issues that teachers and schools face. Um, we are not anti-public school. We are not, we are not a pro-charter school, pro-voucher, pro-fix the district organization. We are a parent organization. So I just want to level set with that. Like, Parents are our customers. So, you know, we get branded as like the voucher organization or the charter organization. Um, and we're really not that. Like we are really kind of like people who believe that parents know their kids best. And we don't believe that political ideology should control what parents do with their kids. Nor do we think that the state should control what parents do with their kids. So I just, like that's who we are, and I, and I want to be really clear about <clears throat> that. I am not an expert on school finance. Uh, so, so what we have, like we brought thousands of families to Austin and elsewhere. So we try to elevate parent voices and provide opportunities for real parents who are the consumers of um, the education structure we have in place. Um, look, every one of our parents is a taxpayer. So they are paying for this and consuming this system we've set up. Um, and so, you know, we try to elevate parent voices and provide parents with opportunities to engage um, when and where it's possible and appropriate. Um, and is C3 permissible, just to say. Um, we try very hard not to ever engage in lobbying. Um, but we do know a little bit about kind of the state of affairs. So I'm gonna give you kind of an overview of where we are, uh, just for some level setting. 60% uh, of students in uh, public schools in the state of Texas are considered economically disadvantaged. 60% in the state uh, who are enrolled in public school today are considered economically disadvantaged. And, and only 10% of those students of the, that 60% will earn a post-secondary credential of any kind. That's CTE, that's college degree, right? Like, so that number should terrify everybody here. <laughs> These are a significant number of kids who are not gonna be employable adults. Uh, because, so, so what I'd say is, we're not, maybe we're not spending enough, but what we are spending, we're fully convinced and the parents we serve are convinced we're not even spending it in the right way. So what we're doing with the billions of dollars ought to be a question on every taxpayer's mind. Like, how are we spending this much money and getting such crappy results? I mean, it's, you know, and we will pay for the, we will pay for this poor ROI all along the way. We don't get out of paying for this. So, um, so just, just wanna like level set there that we are, uh, that 10% of that 60% are earning some post-secondary degree. And if you are an African-American male or Hispanic male in the state of Texas, your likelihood of getting any post-secondary credential is about 7%. 7 percent. 7 percent. 7 out of 100 if you are low-income male of color. And again, like, that I find morally outrageous, but it actually it's a massive economic problem. It's a train wreck. Uh, so we're not, you know, we're not educating people for the workforce. And so what we do, we ought to spend more money on schools, probably. But we're also not spending the money we're currently spending well. And so, you know, we think that that needs to sort of be addressed. Um, so. Let me also just uh, <clears throat> give you a sense of the, like just some facts. Um, we have in this state about 600, this was confirmed um, by the head of the Texas Charter School Association, we have about 675 charter schools in this state. We have about 337 students enrolled in charter schools and we have about 140,000 families on charter school wait lists. So whatever, you can judge them however you want. The reality is we have people who are looking for school choice in all kinds of forms. Um, and so, and then 20% of the A-rated 
districts that are in this state are charter districts. That's just another sort of fact. And Hispanic students uh, who attend charter schools um, outscore statewide eighth grade students, um, Hispanic students across all states, um, according to the nation's most recent report card. So, um, so I think that there's some good news. And then lastly, charter schools are the only schools in the state, if they're failing, that can be shut down and we have closed them. So we do close charter schools. Uh, that said, we don't think charter schools are the answer. Uh, we think charter schools, plus homeschooling, plus private schooling, plus virtual schooling, plus really, really strong district schools, traditional schools, is really the answer. So there is, across the board, no silver bullet. Um, and, I, and I think that our state of affairs right now is that it's very much an us versus them scenario that's being sold to the public. Um, so we're sort of being told, charters are ruining district schools and private schools are terrible. And the bottom line is like, parents don't buy it. They just don't, right? Parents, parents either move to the suburbs or they go to magnet schools or they go to IV schools or they go to charter schools. Um, but every single parent we've ever met really wants the best school for their child and our position is we ought to provide that. Um, so what I would say is the state of school choice in Texas is really poor. <laughs> Uh, which is fascinating, right? So uh, the organization I run looks to Florida as an example of what really would be amazing, which gives parents maximum flexibility as taxpayers to be in control of their own tax dollars and to choose a school that's right for them. Uh, we don't do that here. We don't have a, a private school choice bill. So there is no voucher bill. There's no tax credit scholarship. We don't have ESAs. Uh, we're one of the few red states that does not have a form of private school choice. Um, and I'm fundamentally unclear that we will ever have that because the House would not, will not pass a, a choice bill. Um, you know, and again, we're not a lobby organization, but um, we think that this is a disadvantage to parents. We think it's a disadvantage to taxpayers. And uh, we think that it puts the NEA and the AFT right in the driver's seat. So um, the other reason I'd say that the state of affairs in Texas, and this may not be relevant in your minds to you all, but is very poor, um, is you know we're working mostly with large urban, I mean, the majority of our parents were HIC parents <clears throat> eight years ago when I started Families Empowered. And we actually track, we've got a big database and we track all of our families. And what I would say before is like, we were serving families in the donut hole, right? Like in the middle, and all those families are moving out. So now what I tell people is the donut is tastier than the hole. Parents are figuring it out, right? So you're seeing suburbs that are more diverse, economically, racially, in every way. You have parents, any parent with means is getting out. Because HISD, and I'm, now I'm gonna get canned because I'm sure that you're live streaming this. It's a disaster. It's a disaster, right? So the former head of the Houston Teachers Union, Gail Fallon, who I like, I like Gail. She's a good person, she cares about teachers. She's a good, she's a good person. We have very different political views, but I like Gail. Gail said to me last year at an event, we finally have the board we want. Think about it. We finally have the board we want. And that district is in debt. They are circling the drain. They are in debt. They're going to continue to be in debt. They know they're a Robin Hood district. They continue to squander money. Um, they fight. No privates, no chart. They are losing. And those folks who can move, they're moving here. They're moving to Katy. They're moving to Fort Bend. They are moving out because they are good parents who want the American dream. And so the other thing you should know is out-of-state money is being spent on school boards in the state of Texas. TASB, TASA, 
all those organizations are lockstep, lockstep with the unions that are incredibly powerful outside of the state of Texas. So I would say that HISD is the canary in the coal mine. They got the board they wanted, and they're coming for your school board next. So I, and I think that the issue that they're using, the wedge issue really is choice and charter schools. Um, and I just, I think that that's, I, I really think it's a red herring. I think it's also pretty tone deaf because parents want options. They just do. Um, and so we can demonize parents. And I, as a parent, I find, that, and a former teacher, I, I think that's crazy. And we're just losing. I mean, we started with 8,000 families. Last year in Houston, we launched something called a common application uh, called Apply Houston. We had, it's one application, kind of like college applications, for a number of charter schools. <clears throat> we had 37,000 families apply for 5,000 seats. 37,000, and this year we're pretty sure we're tracking toward about 45,000 families who will use this. We went from an organization that was serving 8,000 families to an organization that's serving 60,000. So the puck in the, in the parent world is headed toward more choice. Micro schools, um, homeschool cooperatives. You know, 10 years ago, homeschoolers were, I mean, this were very, very specific kinds of folks. Now they're really diverse families. I live in the woodlands. It's parents who want more flexibility, parents who don't want their kids bullied, and they, or, or parents who feel like their kids just aren't being educated. Um, they might not be particularly religious, which 10 years ago they tended to be more religious, more conservative, more politically conservative. You have across the spectrum parents who are just opting out. And we have this infrastructure that we're paying for, right? So some of the things that we are looking toward, um, we think there will be no private school choice bill this session. There just won't be. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but there, I, I don't think there will be. Um, we have a speaker, again, a new speaker who doesn't support private school choice, just, you know, like Strauss did. So that's, the house is where it's like the crusher of dreams for all innovation and education. So, you know, so I think that, that the governor and lieutenant governor know where that's headed. The entire focus will be on school finance. Um, I think for us, the things that we're particularly excited about and think are promising are like House Bill 1842, which will be under attack. That's a district of innovation bill. It allows districts to, instead of compete with charters, actually create innovative schools and partner with charters, and they receive more money for that. Um, there are tons of incentives to provide innovative new schools. Uh, so, you know, we're really interested in that bill. We think that would be under that would be under attack. Um, you know, like I said, our our our. On the one hand, I'm more optimistic than I've ever been because we just see so many amazing parents who are like pretty fed up and are kind of. Uh, I think willing to do all kinds of super interesting things. Um, and on the other hand, I think we're about to spend a lot more money. We're not talking about outcomes. We're not talking about return on investment. We're talking about spend, spend, spend. So the question is, how much does it cost to educate a child? I mean, that wasn't raised. <laughs> like, how much do we need to spend to get better results than we're getting now? And I think we're going to have a conversation about spending money, and we should have a conversation about results. And so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure who, who, who is most able to have that conversation, but I'm going to tell you right now, TASA, TASB, all the school board, they don't want to have that conversation. So y'all are taxpayers, you're politically active. I, I, you know, I hope you're asking about that. Um, because we're paying for a system that I actually think by any private sector standard is failing. Um, some other just kind of interesting things that are gonna happen in the next year that you should be aware of. We do have a state 
district report cards that are available online through TEA. Uh, TEA has spent tons and tons of money to build an infrastructure uh, that will provide in the next year, I think starting in August, parents will have access to campus-based report cards. So I, as a parent, can log in and see how my campus is rated. Um, we're gonna be promoting that like crazy. We are gonna, because we think transparency is really, really important. Um, every campus will get an A through F rating. We're gonna be letting parents know. So, um, you yeah. say that, sorry to interrupt, but you say that for public schools, for the charter schools themselves also be rated? Yeah, yeah, charter schools are public schools. They're required to take all the same tests. Um, I, I think if you were to ask the Charter School Association, again, you could say they're biased. I know a number of charter operators. They actually don't receive that. I mean, they receive no bond money. They don't receive facility funding. Um, and they often have to raise philanthropy to pay for buildings. So charter schools are public schools. They're publicly funded. They're required to take all the same tests. Um, and we have, in our state, actually over-regulated, in my personal opinion, charter schools. So there are there's very little distinction from a regulatory perspective between a charter school and a traditional public. They're all public schools. Um, I think the interesting question is like, yeah, so charter schools will be rated. Um, yeah. Pardon? So what we're seeing are more families who are opting to homeschool because what's interesting is homeschool cooperatives are creating opportunities for homeschoolers to do things like play football and the football, basketball, but all that sort of really important social stuff that kids need and want. Um, that's that those things are more available because of technology. Uh, virtual schooling is really becoming much more popular. I mean, we have tons of parents who are doing virtual schooling. And then the cost of online tutoring is lower now. So there are lots of parents who might not have been able to teach chemistry or physics or you know advanced literature, and you can get an online tutor now for for for, for a lot less than you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, look, I'm not a homeschool, let me just be clear, we're not a homeschool organization, and so the majority of the parents that we work with are going to, I mean, let me be really clear, we work with districts, we work with Fort Bend, we work with HIC, we work with Spring Branch, we're really excited about Spring Branch and Fort Bend. <coughs> So homeschooling was something that 10 years ago we were kind of like, uh, we don't really, what, we're not really sure what this is. I, I don't have good data on homeschooling, and I don't, I can't answer your question. There is actually no requirement in the statute that uh, qualifies homeschooling. I mean, when you look at anybody who has decided to go to homeschooling. Yeah, well, I, I don't have a problem. So, so I guess what I would say is, we're seeing more parents interested in homeschooling and interested in doing it in a way that actually delivers content that is responsible to kids, but we don't judge parents. If a parent comes to us and says, I want to homeschool, what we'll say is, okay, and here are like three other options for you. I, I just want to describe the, I'm going to just give you guys a glimpse of the kind of experience we deal with. We had an event two months ago and there was a dad, and we don't get a lot of dads, we mostly get moms who come to our events. We had a dad who came with his son. The son was sitting in a corner, and I'm a former teacher, I've been in this work for a long time. This kid had a tremor, kind of like Parkinson's type of a tremor. He couldn't make eye contact. He had been beaten up in his school. Beaten. The dad wanted to make sure I knew he wasn't making it up, and he's showing me photos on his phone of his, you know, his son in the hospital. It's like an older Hispanic dad, he's super nice. The guy starts crying. He's like, what can I do? I need to find a school. Now my kid has neurological issues, he has anxiety issues, and the district's saying they got the bullies out of the school, but he's afraid to walk into that school, because of course he was beaten in his school. And he said, and I don't know if they have the resources 
So like what we would do with that parent is we said, okay, here, call us on Monday. We got his number. Here are some schools you may want to consider. And this dad said, I'm willing to move. I'm willing to move. So like the stakes are really high for every, every person. So if that dad said, I'm going to homeschool, I have no place to judge that parent. That's my view, and that's the view my organization takes. It's his kid. Yes. <clears throat> Colleen, I remember that you all got really enthusiastic about school vouchers. Uh -huh. And then uh, even your own data shows that if people have vouchers in their hands, there isn't enough charter school seats for them to leave the school districts and go to yeah. these seats. So, Let me finish. Yeah. So really what charter school vouchers would become is a kind of a musical chairs within school districts. No. You know, is, is that not going to be that, you're gonna, that's you're gonna go leave a losing school and go to a good school but in the same district? So you're maybe? totally conflating things. So first of all, you said charters and vouchers. They're totally separate. I said, well, I meant vouchers. So there are, there are a significant number, for, so vouchers and charters aren't even in the same universe. Charters are public schools. And so we have, we, we have more demand for seats, but we also have, we have thankfully now, uh, I think we have more charters being authorized last year and the year before than we have in previous years. So we're going to have lots of independent operators who are going to be opening charters, and we have charter growth plans from almost all of our charter management organizations. So I, I think that charters are working really hard to create new seats. Those aren't vouchers. Vouchers would give people the ability to take their tax dollars and go to a private school. So there are, and by the way, just, so 65 to 68% of our parents, when asked if they would be willing to take a scholarship, said, if we said, if there was a scholarship available to you, would you take it? The majority of our parents said, absolutely, yes, I would. Um, and we work with the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. We work with the Archdiocese of San Antonio and Austin. And Catholic schools are absolutely under-enrolled in, in mostly urban core. They're expanding in the suburbs and busting at the seams. But they have seats. They're shuttering schools. And you have an archdiocese that's saying, we have a mission to serve the poor. But that is a fundamental Christian Catholic mission. And they don't want to close these seats. So there actually is capacity. Um, but there, no, there aren't enough A seats. But the solution isn't, let's track people. Let's, let's hold their tax no, money I, I don't believe that. But it, I believe that the last debate exposed the fundamental issue of capacity. Yeah, I There's think not it, enough capacity to absorb, take people out of the public school venue and even put them in private school. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess what we would say is like, that's a terrible reason to constrict a market. What you do is you open up the, the resources and then, and then you will see markets created. Like there's an organization, there's a school called Talent Unbound. It's actually near here. Talent Unbound is through the Acton Academies. In, they are doing micro schooling. And I, I actually think these are like $6,000 a year private schools that are super fascinating, have tons of potential. And I actually think you would see schools created that we can't even imagine that would be designed locally and run locally by, by teachers, by educators who want to start their own schools. I mean, so the, the fact is that if you're saying our current market, which isn't efficient and providing return on investment, like, I don't think that, like, I actually don't think what we have now is sufficient. So, but the reality is there's no private school choice bill that is going to, I mean, that's, it, let's just say the NEA won. They won. They're the winners. They got it. They squashed, they squashed it in Texas, and that they're waving that flag all over the place. Colleen, you, yeah. you, you mentioned earlier that you have, got 37,000 families yeah. looking for seats. Yeah. That can make a difference with it, getting a bill? Well, so let's just be really clear. Um, I think what you all have done is pretty brilliant. You're organized and you vote in primaries. Our parents are not organizing around this point. 
and they're generally, I would say, split politically on a whole host of other issues. So if you're not a primary voter, you have no struggles in the state of Texas, right? And you, you guys know that better than anyone. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm here in the school, vouchers, homeschooling, and other ways that the summer, got 5,000 applicants for 200 positions. The root cause of all this is failing students. Everybody is trying to get one way or another. Yeah. There shouldn't be failing students. No, there shouldn't be. There's no way to solve the bigger problem here. Until that is, it will be addressed, so move the political directives, move the sacred cause. Yeah, like I, I actually, so I think Larry Taylor's been really great. I think Paul Bencourt's been really great. I think Lucia's actually kind of great. I think, um, I, I actually think the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor care a lot about this issue, but they're political, they're all, you know, so that they're, uh, they're pretty decent. Um, there are other, You know, I, I think that there are Jacek Eisen's, there, there are some really good folks that are really good on this, but they actually, a lot of them stepped out in the last session and they, they got, they didn't get a lot of support. I would honestly say from the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor at the end of the day, they put their, you know, Ben Corp has been a leader um, and so has Larry Taylor and, um, and they didn't really get support at the highest level. And so if, if you're a politician, you're making trade-offs all the time. Um, and accountability is also a hard thing too, right? Like we've really bungled that in a lot of ways um, and not used it appropriately, but we need it. <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there are people who really care about this issue. You know, and, and by the way, many of our parents are living in districts that are, uh, where their representatives are, are urban dens. And uh, they're really bad on this issue. And so they don't even know that. So those that do vote don't know that those people are really bad on that issue, this issue. Colleen, yeah. are you uh, tying on the threats of, are you aware of a state that does have a piece of Oh yeah, Florida. The state of Florida. The state of Florida, I think, is a leader on this issue. Um, and Edline Excellence is a really great site to go to, but they have an organization called Step Up for Students that's a really great organization um, that has done an amazing job of coalition building among all kinds of parents that are different. So like this, uh, this political idea, you know, you can bridge political divides on other issues on this issue. Um, they've done a great job of promoting teachers who support choice, and actually choice is good for teachers. Because you're not engaging in collective bargaining. You actually have the ability to say like, I'm not gonna work in this school, I'm gonna work in this school, and I'm gonna actually negotiate my salary like I would in the private sector, versus letting some union negotiate my work. So. We've done a really bad job in our state even bringing teachers along, I think. I think we've demonized teachers, and um, teachers benefit from school choice. That's, that's our position. But yeah, so Florida would be the exemplar. Yeah. So my question is, you, you talked about return on investment and how we kind of demand you know, how we handle charter schools. The charter schools are getting $1,000 more per student. That's actually, I don't think that's It's true. actually true. And so, and if, if, so I guess that's part of my but next they're question. they're not getting facility dollars, so how is that? Yes, they are actually. They're funded by taxpayers. They're backed by the taxpayers. So, I mean, you shake your head. I'm asking real questions and, and, and being very considerate to that. 
like, and, and really be honest. And just Sorry. Just the public schools is all you can do. You say that you are for public schools, charter schools, and choice, yet you're sitting here only talking about charter schools. Yeah. You're, I mean, you married one of the founders of the charter school program. I mean, it's pretty, pretty apparent what your agenda is here. Yet you don't want to have, you have no, no facts backing you up. You're just making disparaging remarks about public schools. Because, because okay. charter schools don't get, they're not public schools because they don't have to take everybody. They get to choose who they want to take. They get to pick who they want to choose to take. And if a student gets out of line, they throw them away. Yeah. Is there a so, I, yeah, is how do you answer those questions with like yeah. nothing other than just you sat up there? Okay, for so what minutes. I would say is, is a magnet school a public school? Is a magnet school a public yeah, school? Yeah, is a magnet school a public school? Is the HSPBA a public school? Yes. Well, they actually pick based on a cut score who's in there. So but charter, charter, charter schools are public schools that use lotteries. First of all, but let me be really clear. I have school. made no illusions that we are a school. We believe in school choice because we think it works for parents. I have made no illusions about that. So I'm sorry if that, that's offensive to you. Also, we are a parent service organization. So the 62,000 parents in our network, which is factually true, I don't believe that those people are wrong for being duped for wanting other options. And what I'm telling you is, we send them to places like the Mandarin School or to um, to a, their neighborhood school. We've often said, you know, your neighborhood school is an A school, and then they'll give us a reason why they're looking elsewhere. So I, I have no. Most of our parents, we actually send to traditional public schools, but the fact of the matter is that magnet schools and IB schools are testing for kids. They are using cut scores. They are essentially a quasi-private school fun, fun, funded publicly. Charter schools have a lottery. Essentially, you apply, it's, you pick a number, and you go. That's very, very, very fair. It's actually much more equitable than HSPBA or the Mandarin School or any magnet school that uses it or a gifted and talented program that uses some some criteria just like a private school. So, so look, if we're gonna just be clear here, let's eliminate magnet schools. Let's get rid of all of our schools of choice and then I would have that debate. I'll take anyway. one last question for Colleen. Yeah. Well, go ahead, yeah. Nancy, since you are asked one. Is it, is it the real issue on education of the city or charter or private or anything else? Like that? It's just a smaller class size. I mean, is it? I mean, if public yeah. school all went down to 14 students or teachers, would that solve the issue? Well, I mean, it might. It might. more expensive. It might, it might not. I mean, you could have a high school class. Why does a kid who's 17 need to be in a classroom of 22? in October and then the following October they can be in a room of 500 at UT. I mean, I think the class size debate is, is a really important one and I think in elementary school, if we had smaller elementary schools, I think that would be a big win. I think parents agree with that. But I don't think that that's true in high school. I mean, I, I just... No, I would just know it's school size. Right, but again, if we were rethinking schools, if we rethought schools in general, Maybe we would rethink high schools to better fund elementary schools. <coughs> but we're not. We're building buildings based on real estate plans that constrict everything we do. You know? So, okay, well, thank you, Molly. That was great. Thanks thank for having me. She'll be around.